Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's worship service on this Sunday, July 26, 2020. I am your lay leader, uh, Ruling Elder Zach Cosner. Um, I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link under the description for this video, or you can head to www.centralprespb.com, uh, click on the publications link at the top, and you will uh, scroll down and find today's date, and you will find the bulletin there. Uh, once you have uh, downloaded the bulletin, I ask you that uh, you turn your attention to the announcements found on the back of the bulletin. Um, with this being the last Sunday of the month, we'll be announcing a decision about in-person worship in the next few days uh, for the month of August. Uh, follow us on social media for uh, further news and updates. Uh, you can look for us under uh, username Central Prez PB. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and YouTube. Links to each are on our website, www.centralprespb.com, where you can also find our online giving page. Uh, at the top of the page, look for the Donate Now link. Uh, we take uh, credit card, debit cards, and checks. You can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. <clears throat> Let us prepare to worship God. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are, are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God, first using the prayer that is printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Help us, O God. We not, do not know how to pray as we ought. We are accustomed to hiding our faults. We scarcely know them well enough to confess them to you. Forgive us our dimness of vision, our dearth of compassion, our failures to remember and appreciate your wonderful works of faithfulness and mercy. Make us patient in our trials, confident in your love, and joyful in your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, and now silently. Amen. As people born of the water and the spirit, we have died to the old life and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. At this point in our usual in-person services, uh, we usually have a children's sermon, uh, which we have not had a chance to have since uh, we went to uh, streaming services. Um, I'm going to take a moment and allow Dominic Munn uh, to take over this video. Um, Dominic is one of our youth. Uh, he has participated in the last two weeks with the uh, Synod of the Sons Youth Workshop. And this week he participated in the, um, with the, a lot of youth from the Presbytery of Arkansas in Montreat at Home. Montreat is a um, camp and conference center located in uh, North Carolina. Um, the Presbytery was gracious enough to pay for um, the Montreat at Home for all participants here in the Presbytery. And Dominic wanted to take a moment to uh, say thanks and, and give an update on what uh, experiences he had through those two uh, initiatives. 
So we're gonna go ahead and give it over to Dominic Munn. Hello everybody. My name is Dominic Munn and I am a youth member at Central Presbyterian Church and I attended Sydnoid Youth Workshop and Montreat Youth Workshop at home and I had a blast. I had a very great time and I learned a lot of new things through the keynotes and speakers and the songs and the energizers and the messages and I met a whole lot of new people. I got really close, well, a lot closer to God and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity and for giving me the experience. Thank you, Dominic. That is an awesome looking t-shirt. I am very jealous that you got one and I do not have one yet. Um, I love my Presbytery t-shirts that I get when I accompany you guys to the um, youth quakes. And um, I'm very sad that I have not gotten this year's sh shirt yet. Um, with that all being said, uh, let's go ahead and turn it over for this week's message to uh, Reverend Tim Reeves. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Glad you could gather with us virtually this morning as we worship God. Let us listen now for the Word of God. Our first reading comes from the 29th chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the 15th verse and proceeding through verse 28. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her work, her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Our second reading comes from the eighth chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with the 26th verse and proceeding through verse 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but, we, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? 
Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> and finally, from the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 31st verse and proceeding through verse 33, then picking up at verse 44 and proceeding through verse 52. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it is full, they drew it ashore, or when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. That hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. It's <clears throat> easy to look at the world around us and conclude that little has really changed since the time of Genesis. Life is full of wheeling and dealing and manipulating others to one's own advantage. Jacob had exhibited that in obtaining his brother's birthright then later in deceiving Isaac so that he might receive the blessing meant for Esau. But now the tables are turned, and the trickster, Jacob, is on the receiving end of deception. And while on the surface this story may seem to be about little more than Jacob getting his well-deserved comeuppance, there is more at stake. Others get hurt along the way. Both Leah and Rachel will later be used as little more than pawns. And a series of events filled with jealousy and rivalry and intrigue are set into motion. Jacob would make it more than clear among his wives and concubines that Rachel was his favorite. 
and he would make that clear among his sons as well, favoring Joseph and Benjamin, the sons Rachel bore, over all of his other sons. One need only look at the present circumstances to find similarities. No, the issue is not the passing off of one daughter to be married in place of the other, but the wheelers and dealers still hold sway, reaping huge benefits while others are hurt along the way. It's enough to make any of us pessimistic. That's how things have always been. That's how they will always be. One might as well join in the wheeling and dealing and look out for number one. Everyone else does so, right? Actually, though, the answer is no. Because Paul reminds us, if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? He goes on to say that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I believe these are some of the most beautiful and majestic words in the epistle to the Romans. They are meant to inspire Christians not only to endure in times of hardship or persecution or when the wheeling and dealing of others comes at our expense, but also to live moral and ethical lives which bear witness to the glory of God. That is the context in which all of chapter 8 of Romans was written. This chapter comes immediately on the heels of Paul's discussion of doing those things he hates instead of the things he wants to do. And it was in this discussion that Paul would say, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what Paul is asserting is that through the grace of our Lord, we are more than conquerors, not only of the evil in our midst, but also of the evil in ourselves. It is therefore not only possible, but also expected that all who profess the name of Christ will respond with love in the midst of hatred, compassion in the midst of injustice, righteousness in the midst of sin, goodness in the midst of evil, light in the midst of darkness, and patience even in the midst of persecution. All of this is what I like to call the vast mustard seed conspiracy. Or to put it another way, as Christians, we are to be a corrupting influence in the world. Sounds like an odd thing to profess, I know. But to understand this, we must turn our attention again to the parables in the 13th chapter of Matthew. And the first of the parables we read this morning is that of the mustard seed. Now, to early Christians, one important message of this parable was that out of very small beginnings, something, something much larger and grander would appear. And that is an important message. But a couple of other things are going on in this parable that unfortunately get overlooked today. First is Jesus' surprising choice of the image of a mustard seed. Yes, mustard had its uses, ranging from seasoning food to treating any number of ailments, including snake bites, countering poisonous fungi, treating toothaches and soothing uh, stomach troubles according, according to the Roman historian Pliny. So I want you to keep those healing aspects of mustard in the back of your minds. Another thing I want you to keep in mind is that, in the back of your mind, is that the, <clears throat> the mustard seed or mustard plant was considered a weed which once was present, nearly was impossible to get rid of. It would come back year after year. Think of kudzu today. Once it is there, you might as well say that it is there to stay. 
Jesus' listeners would have been scandalized to hear of one intentionally planting a mustard seed, a weed, in a field where other crops were planted because this would violate the purity laws laid out in the book of Leviticus. In the 19th chapter, verse 19 of Leviticus, we read this, you shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your fields with two kinds of seed, nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. And though these statutes may seem ludicrous to most of us living in the 21st century, the intent of these statutes was to honor the order of creation and thereby faithfully revere God as the creator. So the presence of a mustard seed, which Jesus likened to the kingdom of heaven, has a corrupting influence. Yet another aspect is that Jesus, in telling this parable, may have had a very specific image in mind, an image from the book of Daniel. Because in the fourth chapter of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in which he describes a tree at the center of the earth whose height was so great that its top reached up to heaven and that it was visible by the entire earth. Its foliage reports Nebuchadnezzar was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it provided food for all. The animals of the field found shade under it, the birds of the air nested in its branches, and from it all living beings were fed. Now in that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, that tree stood for the mighty kingdom of Babylon. One would expect Jesus, therefore, to compare the kingdom of heaven to something even greater and more noble than that tree in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but instead he compared it to a mustard seed, which grows into a shrub. Jesus' point is pretty clear. The kingdom uh, and its greatness will one day be visible, but not in the form that we expect. And that, too, is important for us to keep in mind, because Jesus always made it clear that the kingdom of heaven was going to save and rescue this world precisely by its virtue of being so very different from the powerful, flashy, showy political kingdoms which ca capture our attention most often. From the world's perspective, the kingdom may look small, even foolish, but God is bringing about wonders that will leave every one of us in awe. The kingdom of, of, of heaven is not what one would expect in earthly terms of greatness. I love how one of the verses in the hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal, puts it. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. God is conspiring against all earthly notions of greatness and redefining greatness in terms of love and sacrifice and service. The corrupting influence of the kingdom then is meant to bring about heal healing and wholeness and justice to God's creation. And it does so precisely because it acts in ways completely different than the ways of the world. Our Lord's was not a message of make Israel great again. His was never a promise that his followers would experience so much prosperity that they would grow sick of winning. And this point is further seen in the parable of the leaven hidden in three measures of flour because leaven was also considered a corrupting influence. That's why during the Passover, Jews clear out all leaven from their house and eat unleavened bread. So when Jesus compares the kingdom to leaven, he is saying something akin to one bad apple spoils the barrel. Thus, the parable of the yeast pictures the kingdom as a hidden force 
working silently to corrupt the world. That is, to corrupt the corruption. Or as the whimsical lyrics of a country song once put it, you're going to ruin my bad reputation. One cannot see the kingdom pervading the world. But when its covert fermentation is accomplished, the bland flower of the world will have been transformed into the joyous bread of life, to quote Tom Law. This is what God is up to in the world. The reign and realm of God is meant not only to undermine, but overthrow the powers of sin and death. God is flooding creation with resurrection life, with grace, with forgiveness, with love, and a peace which surpasses understanding. God is active in ways not always discernible to the casual observer. But God is overcoming all of our evil schemes, all of our wheeling and dealing, and bringing about God's will in, through, and more often than not, in spite of us. Remember that God would use even the deception of Laban to bring about beautiful purposes. Leah would give birth to, among others, Levi and Judah, the priestly tribe that gave us Moses, and the royal tribe that would give us David, Solomon, and eventually Jesus. In like manner, God would use the most horrific act of evil, pain and degradation in the form of a cross to bring about reconciliation. Through God's grace, we are more than conquerors because God has conquered sin and death. This is the great and good news which we have received and which we are privileged to tell to others. And this brings us to the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl, because in both, Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to something of such value that nothing else but acquiring it matters. And he implies that all that is needed to spread the kingdom is to share the good news, to present it as the treasured gift it really is. Ours is simply the task to take part in the glory of God's ever-growing and expanding kingdom. Ours is the joy of knowing that in Christ we are more than conquerors. Ours is the assurance that sin and death in us and in the world are utterly defeated. And ours is the ministry of continuing to be a corrupting influence. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now that you please uh, join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and our offerings. Again, as I said at the uh, beginning of the service, we are taking our offering electronically. Uh, if you head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, click on the Donate Now link, and uh, you can uh, make, a, uh, make an offering using check, debit card, or credit card. If you would like to uh, mail an offering to the church, our address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the, your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. 
Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every, name in, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns. Uh, first, I would like to personally uh, take a moment to thank everyone for their joys, and, I mean, for their prayers, excuse me, uh, on the um, occasion of Laura Langston and I moving. Um, it has been a, a very stressful few weeks. Um, I apologize for not being able to get uh, the uh, video surrounding uh, uh, Tim's sermons uh, done these last few weeks, um, but we do appreciate your prayers. Uh, we are about 80% unpacked, and in fact, uh, at this very moment, my uh, my wonderful wife and her friend are redecorating the new home. Um, soon, we uh, we hope uh, to have everyone over um, once this coronavirus uh, pandemic ends. Um, we miss everyone terribly, and um, but we do thank you for your prayers about the move. Um, we've been asked to continue to pray for uh, Brad von Tunglin. Uh, who is continuing to have um, uh, medical issues. Um, again, we'll, we'll mention Dominic. Uh, uh, Jessica mentioned that he had a great time uh, at the last two uh, camps and conferences that he mentioned earlier. Uh, Dominic has a doctor's appointment this week that they could uh, appreciate, they would appreciate your prayers for him. Um, the family of Barbara Lloyd a former co-worker of Rose Von Tunglen um, passed this last week of cancer. And um, we continue to ask for prayers for um, our frontline responders, our doctors and nurses, our medical professionals, all those who are dealing with the public, which is a large, large member uh, number of people now uh, as they uh, continue to try to uh, get our um, lives back to somewhat normal with this uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, Please continue to uh, keep our nation in uh, your prayers as well um, as we continue to uh, undergo strife and um, upheaval through our uh, nation. Um, let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks for the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Uh, please continue to hold Brad in your care. Uh, we thank you for the successful move of the Cosner family. We thank you that Dominic Munn had such a successful uh, and great uh, few weeks at his two camps. Uh, we pray that the doctors at his appointment in these coming days uh, have the wisdom and the knowledge to, to see if there is anything wrong and to provide a successful treatment for those uh, ailments, if there are any. We ask that you be with the family of Barbara Lloyd, who, was, uh, who passed away this uh, last week. Uh, we ask for you for your protection upon our um, nation and our, uh, those people who are dealing one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one with those who are, are sick and uh, be with those who uh, have lost loved ones to the coronavirus pandemic. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace, to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.